So, um, I don't use C++11 in my day job. Um, this is a, uh, an, an evenings and weekends thing for me. I do this uh, in preparation for eventually I'm going to be able to use C++11. So why am I doing a tutorial on R value references? There should be an expert. And it would be a very different talk if there were an expert up here. I am maybe not uniquely qualified to give a talk on R value references, but my qualifications are that I have made in the last few months almost every mistake one can make with R value references. <laughs> so we're going to be looking at a lot of mistakes. We're going to be looking at um, the ways that I have found to understand whether I have made a mistake or not. And hopefully I will highlight here are the mistakes that you can avoid and when you're writing your code how to test for did I make this mistake or not? Um, so I don't know what the future will bring. So I'm, I'm hoping this is representative of uh, what C++11 and 14 do. If someone tells me differently, I will probably believe you. Um, I'm leaving uh, a bunch of includes out of my slides. Generally, if you put these includes in with the code that I've written, hopefully it will build. I also, uh, uh, that's not what I wanted. This is what I wanted. This I find to be particularly handy because static assert requires that you, you give it a quoted argument. And so with this macro, and, and I think I, I was just in Tony's speech where he said, don't use macros. <laughs> so I'm using a macro just to make Tony happy. Um, so this way the, the assert shows what it was you were asserting. So we're going to talk about why in the heck somebody did this stuff, how to implement it. We're going to talk about universal references, which is a Scott Myers terminology. Uh, you will not find that in the standard, and there will be people who will bark at me for using the term. Um, and then overloading with uni universal references, which is uh, one of the easier places to make mistakes. And then we'll, uh, we'll summarize. So. We're going to move. What, why did anybody do this? What, why did somebody introduce R value references? So we're going to improve performance in specific important cases. And almost as a side effect, we're going to allow people to make uh, non-copyable types movable. Uh, but that was only a, a, a Again, that was only a secondary issue. It was really about performance. So C++ uh, was released in 1995. And generally, Java was slower than C++. Well, let's see, and I've got my numbers wrong. Anyway, so anyway, Java was slower than C++. Java was faster for passing big objects. Why was that? It really had to do fundamentally with the way Java dealt with data. Any significant size, any, anything that was not a value type, there are very few value types in Java. Anything that was an object always went on the heap. And it was reference counted. So here I have an object. And I'm going to return that. Um, so this, this is my stack. This is intended to represent a scroll. This is the best I can do with PowerPoint. Um, there may be someone who could do better. I'm sure there are people who could do much better with PowerPoint. This is intended to represent a scroll so that my stack can unwind and then wind back up. So here we have a, a Java object. And on Java, the only thing that you have on the stack is a reference. It's very small, easy to move. So if I want to return an object, 
in Java. All I have to do is create another object here, kick up the reference count here, and then poof, this thing's gone. We decrement the, uh, the reference count, and it's moved. Yes? Technically, Java is garbage shell and not reference count. OK, thank you. I'm not a Java person. Thank you. So, yeah. oh, so, so the statement was, Java is garbage collected, not reference counted. Yeah. Thank you. Ah, for that. Thank you. So if we do this in C++, we've got objects on the stack. Now, an object may or may not have part of its appendages sitting on the free store. If something's not, if, if an object has no contents on the free store or elsewhere, there are places other than the stack, then you know, the only thing you can do is copy it back up. But if you've got something sitting on the free store, then it'll be over here and you're referring to it from the stack over to the free store. So if you're returning an object, you know, in C++, uh, yeah, and, I, and here I've kicked the numbers over to 89 because we'll, we'll get to the return value optimization in a minute. So if you were prior to the return value optimization, which came about in 1991 initially, and this took a while to percolate into compilers. So we're going to have this local object, and we have to copy all parts of it up one level. We have to have unique copies. So now that we've got that unique copy, our scroll rolls up, the destructors run, everything's gone. But we had to copy a bunch of junk. Well, it wasn't junk. It was stuff that we had to have. We had to copy a bunch of stuff. And that's slower. Now, like I said, starting in 1991, the return value optimization was introduced. And what was interesting about the return value optimization is that you didn't even have to build this thing locally at all. You don't have to build whatever you're returning. You don't build that in your own local part of the stack. Somebody upstairs, when they said you're going to return this, they, uh, they handed you a place where you can build this thing. And you build it in place where it will be returned. There are no moves. There are no copies. It's just where it needs to be. So. This is cool, um, but it doesn't work all the time. Um, specifically, let's say that I have two vectors and I'm passing a condition so that at the point when this code's executing, we don't know uh, which of those two guys are going to be returned, either VA or VB. Then the semantics of construction don't allow me to say, oh, well, I'm going to guess that one of these things is more likely to be upstairs. So I'm going to construct it up there. Oh, no, that wasn't the right one. I'm going to run its destructor and then substitute this other one. That's not allowed. So we have to build them locally and then copy them up. It's very silent. OK, I guess I won't worry about it. So we have uh, similar kinds of problems with vector pushback. I've got, this is my vector, and it has its local, uh, not, not all objects have a part out on the free store. But let's just talk about string as a, as a favorite example. At least I think strings are ubiquitous. They're all over the place. So they're a good thing to talk about. So here we are. We've got a vector of strings. Uh, our vector is full. And we've got this stuff sitting over on the free store that's all referenced by, by these, uh, these strings. And we're going to do another push, or we're going to push one more object in. The vector's full. So we've got to make a new chunk of memory for the vector. So we're going to do that. Well, when we did that in 98, not only did we need to copy all this stuff over, but we had to copy all of these as well. And we have to copy this over to here. 
And once we've done all that copying, then we can wipe away the old one. Okay? So there were folks on the standards committee who were really worried about this performance stuff, and that, you know, that was good. We're, we appreciate that. Um, so the first paper was uh, September 2002, Howard Hennant, Peter Demoff, uh, Dave Abrams. Um, these are some of the brightest folks I've ever met. <laughs> At least I've met two of them. Um, and Peter is responsible for a shared pointer. So, you know, smart folks. And the, uh, there was a lot of work that went into this. There were a lot of papers. So the first paper, where it proposed language support to identify temporaries. It proposed a means to explicitly treat non-temporaries as temporaries. And it introduced some terminology, an R-value reference, and move. So when we move, so we've, we've seen the old case. Let's look at the new case. So here we are with our stack. We've got our object down here. We've got some stuff on the free store. What we're going to do is we're going to take the things over here. We're going to remove the references from here. We're going to move, we're going to create this object up here, have it have the references. There's no garbage collection, no reference counting. This thing is now decoupled from the stuff over here on the free store. It's basically in kind of a zombie state. And now the stack's going to scroll up. It's a catchy tune. So we've got the same kind of thing with a vector. We're going to do our, our vector pushback. Um, so this time, instead of creating copies, we're going to steal all of those, all that storage from this guy. And we don't have to do any extra creation over here in the free store. We're not going out to allocate memory. We're not, I mean, <coughs> this, is, this is a huge win. Yes, please. Why isn't storage 5A? Well, I so it depends. It, it, that depends. That depends on, on whether the, the pushback, you know, this, if one were moving from object 5A, then yeah, you can steal the storage. But we don't know whether, you know, in this particular case, I'm not, I'm not asserting that, that when they did that pushback, they did a, a pushback with a move. So in general, we're not allowed to destroy the, the contents of the thing that was pushed back unless we know that it can really evaporate. Um, so a finger trap, uh, a, a, a moo can? No, I'll take a finger trap. Oh, you'll take a finger trap. All right. The finger traps are, are lots of amusement. So one of the things you've seen is that something that can actually implement a move, you have to have state stored outside the object. So if, if your object is a, is a tight thing and all the data is right there, move doesn't do you any good. But if you've got something that the, that the object holds that sits on the free store, or if it's you know, some sort of an OS object, so it's not on the stack. It's living somewhere else. It's outside of your, your contiguous object. So if you've got that, and you have to have a valid move from state, and we'll talk about what valid consists of. Um, the rules for standard types that are movable are more constrained than they are for user types. And I have some opinions about what makes a good type. And maybe I'm not qualified to have those opinions because they're actually in conflict with what Sean Parent thinks. Um, and he's a way better authority than I am. 
but I'll go ahead and share my opinions and you can take them for what they're worth. Um, so, but you have to have some sort of a valid move from state because the destructor will run on the move from object. And so the fact to me that, that the destructor is going to run on it, that indicates that it's still some kind of an object. It's not a partial object. It's not less than an object. It's still an object. So the question is, do you want to even, do you want to even be in this room? Do you want to learn how to do this stuff? And really there are two con or uh, just a few conditions where you, you need to move enable. Um, so do you move enable if you, if you don't care about performance because moving is only an optimization. Moving is, is a faster way to copy. So if you don't care about performance, don't bother with any of this business. Just go ahead and copy. And, and that's in, a, in direct conflict with several of the talks I've heard. But you know, a lot of people who are involved in C++ really do care about performance. So maybe this is silly. But anyway, if you, don't, if you don't care about performance, and so your types can benefit from move if they aggregate movable types, which means there's like a string has a piece that's out on the free store. Or if you have some sort of external movable state, you know, if you have an, an object that, that references the free store, or if you reference the free store yourself directly, either of those, then yeah, uh, move, can, move can save you some time. So these are some uh, of the standard types that move. Yes? If you can go back to that previous slide. Yeah. Uh, on one of your earlier slides, you actually listed another motivation for move enabling classes, but you didn't talk about it here. That's yeah. when either copying would have side effects, but you can avoid those with a move. Yeah. So or if the type isn't copyable, like OS handles, you don't want two copies of the same thing pointing to the same handle. Yeah. Okay. Great. So the 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 uh, assertion was there's another reason to do it. Which which thank you very much. That's an error in the slides, and you get a cow. Boy, um, <laughs> that'll be fun in my life. Uh, this is this is the bad one though. Um, Pass that over. I, one of my first earlier talks, I started throwing things and people got hit. <laughs> so, so I'll try to be more careful. These these things actually, they're they're hard plastic, so they've got some impact. Uh, so the the point was that there is another motivation to move enable your classes. If your type doesn't copy, but you want to be able to move it, and thank you very much. Um, and I guess. So the, so the focus on the rest of the slides really was, it continue, we'll, we'll slide away from, for the most part, move only types, uh, because they're, they're comparatively easy to implement. I didn't worry about it too much, sure. but, but I think it's an excellent point. So these are types that move in the standard library. And uh, that subset, uh, that subset, those are all move only. So what we've already seen is that moving is a euphemism. What we're doing is we're stealing from something. And moving sounds nicer. It doesn't, doesn't sound like you're doing something nasty. But what you're doing is you're stealing from something and you're leaving it disabled. You know, you're, you're damaging the object. But we think, you know, what we're doing, and I guess another way to look at it is that, that this is, uh, uh, you know, the re reduce, reuse, recycle. Okay, so, so we're about to send something off to the trash bin of history. So, so rather than recycle that memory, we're going to reuse parts. So, you know, anyway, I like stealing. It's a little bit more dramatic. But the parts that we're stealing don't move. There's nothing moving. The parts that are stealing are stationary. The address doesn't change. We are changing what was, how the reference goes. So, but everything stays put. And this was a reiteration of my point earlier. If you have an object where it has no references to the free store, 
no references to anything outside of itself, you can't move it. All you can do is copy it. So once you say, gee, I want to be able to do this stuff, um, what can you move from? So you want to avoid breaking old programs. But we still want the, the greater speed. So if you have an old program, what can you steal from without hurting the program? Well, you know, most objects, anything that somebody has a reference to, if you, if you have this thing with a name in your hand and somebody steals the parts out of it, all of a sudden it's not going to behave right and your program's going to be broken. So what category of things can we steal from? Those are temporaries. Temporaries are interesting because we usually don't even get to think about them. The compiler invents them for us and pushes them around and then eventually from, from operations on temporaries, things up getting pushed into values that we can operate on. Once it has a name, then you can, you as a programmer, you can go thrash around with this named thing. But a temporary, you can't, you can't do it. That's all up to the, uh, to the compiler. So what's a temporary? Anything that isn't an L value. And I looked through, I didn't, I didn't spend a lot of time searching through the standard. But any place I found a description in the standard of what an L value is, I couldn't make any sense out of it. Now that's, that's not that unusual for the standard. The standard's hard to read. But I did find this description um, that really makes a lot of sense to me. And I think it's pretty close to what the standard intends. So an L value is an expression that refers to a memory location. So it's somewhere in memory either on the stack or free store or something like that. And it allows us to take the address of that memory location with the ampersand, or the, yeah, the, the and operator. And so anything that doesn't do that is an R value. So anything that we can't get to, that's an R value. So let's, let's look at some stuff that's R values. So up here, these are L values. Because I've got a string named A, I can go you know, beat that one up. I've got a string named B, I can uh, go beat that one up. Give me a B, I've got that B. But if I do this, there are a bunch of temporaries being constructed there. You don't get to see them, but the compiler is building them for you. And then eventually, as a result of the intermediate uh, temporaries, something gets popped into ABC. ABC is an L value. If you uh, construct something in place, so here I've got uh, a function that takes a string and I pass it a char star. So inside that, there's a string. I don't see that. That's a temporary being built. Okay. Do you want a finger trap? <laughs> the statement was this won't compile on GCC. You want a glider? All right. So, I yeah yeah, but it won't go to the right place. Um, I guess I'm a little puzzled that it won't compile on GCC because it I. Okay, that's okay. So I'm 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 using GCC on Windows. Windows GCC will make that string object that it can then take a reference to. Yeah. But GCC no, that that would be true if there was no const. Yeah. Yeah. Visual C plus plus allows it to work without the const, but it'll always work with the const reference. GCC work with the const. Should standard for Yeah. Okay, we'll let you keep the glider anyway. <laughs> Who, uh, out of that particular discussion, who else gets a, gets a, okay. So we're, we, 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 there was a discussion about whether this would compile or not on GCC. And I, I don't know that we came to a conclusion. It did, I did my best to test all of this code on GCC 4.8.2. 
Um, so at least for me, it did compile uh, on Windows once. So if a function returns an object, and we'll get to that in just a second, then that object, that's an R value. So uh, an object type returned by a function is an R value. So here we've got two functions. Uh, get int returns an int, a two. Int is an object. Um, get int ref, we're returning an int reference. That's, uh, that's not returning an object. So, so uh, the returned int ref, that's, that's not a, a, an R value. That's an L value. Um, this is a, a picture I got from, uh, from Howard Hennant that shows all of the things that are object types. And in particular, reference, function, and void are not object types. So none of those will be R values. So now that we're going to do this, this stuff, the reason we're talking about R values is we're going to steal from them. Because this is getting back to how do you, what, what kinds of things can you go mangle without destroying the program? So we're going we're gonna to try to find a way to get a hold of those R values. And so we're adding a new type called the R value reference. And it's got two ampersands. And we still have the same old C++ 98 reference, a single ampersand. That's now called an L value reference. If you call it a reference, people will probably get it. Um, but in terms of the standard, you've got R value references and L value references. And all that does is, is how many ampersands have you got? And what we're going to do with those is we're going to do overloading in order to distinguish between the thing that's getting passed in. Is that an R value or is it an L value? You've used for overloading. So if an R value is coming in, an R value will prefer binding to uh, an amper, uh, a double ampersand. Uh, but it will also b uh, bind to a, a const L value. But L values will never bind to a double ampersand. So if you don't add any double ampersands to your interfaces, everything will still work. Everything will behave the same as it did before. You just won't get the speed improvements. That's all. So again, you can almost afford to ignore all this stuff if you're not worried about the, the speed improvements. So <clears throat> when you're setting up your, uh, your interface, you want to make sure that your ampersands or your, your double ampersand, your R value reference, is not const because you're going to steal from it. Make sense? We're, gonna, we, we're, we're getting past something. I'm putting you all to sleep. I'm sorry. <laughs> so what does a const R value reference conceptually mean then? Um, it means that it's an R value reference and you're not going to be able to do the work you want to do. Uh, because if it's const, then you can't steal from it. So you've got this R value reference in your hand and you're just, all you can do is look at it and say, that's a lovely R value reference. <laughs> <laughs> but as soon as it's, as soon as it's non-const, then you can say, ha! Now I could turn it into a zombie, which is what we all want to do anyway. Is it allowed to make a const? Yes. Yes. There's nothing in the standard that says you, you must declare, you know, that the, 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 the double ampersand uh, cannot be const. So you can declare it as const. It just won't do you any good. Kind of pointless. So this is a heuristic. Um, if you see a piece of code where somebody's using the double ampersand uh, just sitting out 
inside of a function body, then you're, that's almost certainly something that's wrong. Um, it may work. We'll compile and link and all that good stuff. But it's, it, it's probably the wrong thing to be doing. Um, for one thing, it's misleading. You know, it's, it's like when you look at that, you get puzzled. You know, what are they trying to accomplish? So, you know, generally, don't do this. You know, and if you, if you come up with a good reason to do it, because I'm not going to say that in the vast uh, landscape of C++ that there's never a motivation to do this. You know, that, would be, that would be an error on my part because the landscape is big. But everything that, that I found, I am a noob, but I have, I have talked with other folks who are not noobs, and this is not a bad guideline. So if you see a double ampersand sitting someplace other than in a function signer or signature or in a cast, and, and you'd like to not see it in a cast. We'll talk about that later. Um, that's probably an error. Excuse me? Yes. Uh, I've seen some other, other talks, slides, uh, people using double ampersands in uh, range-based for loops, auto, auto, double, double ampersand, something. OK. I, I, was, I thought, looked at that and thought, hmm, I have to read up. OK. Out, so. Work out yeah, and, uh, and thank you. No, I can't. Um, thank you very much. So, so I have just been corrected on the previous slide. Um, this gentleman who gets a cow. Thank you. So a, a reason that you might want to do that, uh, let's say you had you know, a container of things, yeah. and you Works. wanted to Did you pass that back? Uh, move from all of them. Yeah, you, that they're, they're no longer going to be used. Um, then binding that, that the local, the loop local variable by an R value ref so that you can steal from them might be a reasonable thing to do. Okay. So, so uh, let me repeat what the, the gentleman said that, that he's, he's been to talks where he saw an auto double ampersand uh, where in, in a for loop. And somehow someone was doing something useful with that. And it probably had to do with, with generating R value references or you know, how that binding was happening. And, and the person who, who had that for loop was more of an expert than I am. So, so uh, I think you know, the, the term suspect is not bad, but you know, um, uh, what you're saying is that there are probably legitimate uh, uses for it. And uh, just for a heads up, uh, that you don't want to get too comfortable with, with saying that the double ampersand is always an R-value reference. Uh, and we'll get to more details on that later. So. Uh, Part of what the, the standard wanted to do was, uh, in order to get the vector stuff to work, the vector stuff, um, the things that we're moving from, they're not our values. They're actually, you know, if you go back to that picture I had a while ago where we have this vector, we're going to do the pushback. All those things that are sitting in the vector, they're not our values. They're real, honest to goodness values. You know, uh, L values. They have names. They have a place. We want to steal from them anyway. We're going to be, you know, we're going to, we're going, we know that eventually that entire vector is going to expire. So we're going to go in there. We're going to say, I'm forecasting that this stuff is eventually going to become a set of zombies, and then I'm going to nuke them. So we need to find a way to uh, turn those guys into R values so that we can do the nuking. So the way you move from an L value is you do a static cast to an R value reference. And it looks like this. And that would be uh, incredibly ugly to, to scatter all over your code. So the way you want to do it is like this. Call standard move. There is, unless you're writing the standard library, and there are people who, uh, probably nobody in this room, although I, you know, Anyway, 
I, C++ now is the wrong place to say that because there are a lot of people here who write the, uh, the standard library. Um, so if you're writing the standard library, then you have great reasons to, to be writing that kind of stuff. If you're not writing the standard library, use what the standard library provides. It's shorter, it's easier to read, it shows your intent. Standard move moves nothing. There is nothing that moves. All you're doing is you're turning it into an R value reference as far as the compiler is concerned. Something else has to do the moving. So if you can, when you, when you make something that's movable, make it no except movable. Um, swap, if it's, if it's got no except moves, swap becomes no except. And it also helps with vector. And vectors get used a lot. So if you can make your, uh, your, uh, your move no except, then, then do that. So getting back to how would we take advantage of some of this stuff. So if you're returning stuff, uh, don't return a const object. So we were talking about what objects are and aren't earlier. So if you're returning an object, don't return it as a const because then it can't be turned into a zombie. It's going to be returned intact. Nobody can steal from it. And we're actually trying to promote this, you know, being able to steal from stuff. So that, that isn't to say that you should never return anything const. You know, if you're returning a, a reference to something, it makes good sense to, to return it as a const reference. But, uh, but if you're returning a const reference, then you can't steal from it, and that's probably OK. No problem. Yes? Is it, like in that case, would it actually be less efficient in C++11? Because wouldn't you get RVO there? That depends on what's happening to the thing that's being returned. Yeah, so it, uh, the question was, uh, would it necessarily be uh, less efficient in C++11 because the return value optimization would take over? And it depends on what it is that you're, you're doing with the thing that's returned. Um, but the, R, the return value optimization uh, may help you with that. You've got a cow already, so yeah, I got, well, that's okay. we've got these, we've got these. So uh, you prefer a finger trap or a glider? We're down to two gliders. Um, I'll, I'll get a glider. Okay, the glider it is. Did you pass that back for me? Thank you. Thank you. So just because I've seen code like this, um, it's really tempting. You want to be efficient. You want to return that, uh, uh, that R value reference. You really want to do that. If it's a local, don't ever return a reference to a local. Does that, does that make sense to everybody? Okay. And, and you know, to me, this, this really says it all. The stack giveth and the stack taketh away. Um, yeah, and another thing that can happen is that people get excited about move and they start saying, I want to move this, you know, any place that I can move, that's a good thing. Isn't necessarily the case. So if you do a standard move on a local, um, yeah, so, so here we're returning a string. So this is, this is okay, we're returning an object. Um, but if we do a, a standard move on this, then what that's going to do is that's going to disable the return value optimization. So you're actually hurting yourself. What if it's a case like when you said earlier where you can't do the return value optimization because there's some ambiguity? Yeah, and the compilers are really very good about that. I, when I was, was writing test code, so the question was, uh, what about the case where there are two of these objects or more and there's a condition. Does it make sense to, to, to go ahead and do the standard move 
at that point. Um, and and I, was, I was thrashing around with the compiler trying to figure out what this stuff was doing. Um, and at one point I convinced myself that uh, there was a, a situation where GCC was doing a copy rather than a move. And when I went back to it and tried to recreate that situation, I was completely unable to recreate the situation. I think that was my error. Um, I believe that the compilers that are they're dealing with move are very good at recognizing the situation that this this scope is closing. You know, so here I am. I've got these these local objects. Um, they're all zombies. I can I can I can do the move from any of them. So. So if you decide, if you wonder whether it makes sense to do that move call, um, then I would suggest you to do, that you do a test first. So I think the compilers are very good. Uh, Just to talk on this example, uh, the one place you do want the standard move is if you're returning something that's constructible from a string or a value. So if you're actually <coughs> constructing a return value, uh, then you want to use this to be and then you'll call the constructor the thing you construct with the R value of the string. I think maybe I should have you come up and speak into the microphone, because I don't <laughs> think I can repeat that. Sorry. I think I should have you come up and speak into my microphone, because I don't think I can repeat what you just said. Oh, that's it usually picks up, so you don't have to worry about repeating it too much. Okay, okay, thanks. So we had, um, and, and, and you get a cow. <clears throat> so we have, uh, Apparently one case, this one works well. I'm going to send that back. So we have one case where it makes sense to call standard move on the way out. So we've got, you know, why in the heck would we want to do this? What are we going to implement? So there are some, uh, I ended up uh, reducing this into uh, three different ways of, of looking at the problem. Uh, the compiler does a lot of move stuff for you. Um, and then there are all those uh, types in the standard library that are movable. And then eventually, sometimes you have to write your own code. You can't just rely on everything that comes from the standard library. Um, so we've got these uh, C++ 11, or actually C++ special member functions. And uh, so these two at the bottom, they're new with C++ 11. So you have a move constructor, you have move assignment. They're new. And uh, what I'm saying is that the compiler will build these things for you. Sometimes. So here we've got a class. This class has a default constructor. And it doesn't have any other constructor or any of that other stuff. So do I have an assignment operator on this? Boy, I've really put you guys all to sleep. Just so, you know, just, just if it were C++ 98, is there an assignment operator in there? Yeah, OK. So there's also uh, a move constructor and a move assignment. Because you know, we can do a static assert. Is no throw move constructible? That's true. The compiler built those things for you. They're invisible. They're not in the source code, but they're present. So this is kind of magic. You can take already existing code, build it with C++11, C++98 code, build it with C++11, and some of it's going to just kind of magically run faster. That seems pretty cool. Um, so in terms of no accept, when the compiler builds these things, what it's doing is it's looking at the contents of the object, of, of the, the contained non-static data members. So what it's going to do is it's going to, it says, 
standard string supports move. So it, it, it's doing an introspection on the data types. It says, oh, okay, that's a movable type. Therefore, the thing that contains it is also a movable type. So everything that's con if everything that's contained is movable, then your type, this class, move one, that also has move semantics. So if all of the non-static data members have no accept moves, then the compiler generates a no accept move. And it has to look at the move constructor and the move assignment distinctly because each one of them could be, it could have be no accept true or no accept false. Um, so you're going to see a fair amount of test code up here. Um, and the reason for that is that I was struggling with how in the heck do I test this stuff um, when I was trying to get ready for this. Because what you're doing is you're, you're, you're stealing objects. You're, you're leaving zombies behind. If you, you know, how do you, how do you know whether you've actually done this work? And part of this is motivated because a year ago, I wrote what I thought was a correct uh, move constructor. And it turned out I'd implemented copy. It all looked right to me. But I was looking for, you know, this time around, I wanted to be darn sure that I actually got it right. So part of what I'm doing is I'm, I'm examining the, uh, the results of the moved from object. Um, not here in this case. Um, yeah, here. OK. So I'm moving from MC, and I'm going to make sure that MC is empty. So that's, that's the key that I actually successfully moved. Now, at this point, Marshall's going to walk up and, you know, he's actually, I, after Marshall talked about undefined behavior, and I was sort of shaken in my boots because my slides were all ready, and I was wondering, well, gee, am I relying on undefined behavior, which was, you know, legitimate thing to worry about. Um, so it turns out I'm not relying on undefined behavior. I'm relying on unspecified behavior. So I am standing on uncertain ground at the point where I'm examining that string that I've stolen from. Because the precise state of that string is, is not specified by the standard. So a lot of these tests, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm relying on implementation specific stuff. So you can't just walk up and assume that, you know, no matter what the string is after I steal from it, it'll be empty because it might not be. But by thinking about string implementations, I can say, well, probably most of the time this is a legitimate test. I am, but I am relying on unspecified behavior. What I can do is I can call empty. And empty may return true or false. Even though I've stolen from it, 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 may, it may not say that it's empty. And some of that has to do with the way string works, or many string implementations work. Um, if the string is small, then there's the small string optimization that the body of the string may actually go inside of the string itself. In which case, it's up to the implementation is, you know, when you did that, move, it didn't actually move anything. All it could do was a copy. Yes? Once you've stolen from that, from the original one, and you do it as empty, isn't that like an invalid reference then? Is there anything really there? Um, so uh, the question was, if you call empty on, on a string that you've moved from, isn't that an invalid reference? Is that, that's the question. Yeah, that's the question. And you get a cow. Um, so. The, um, the answer is no, and that has to do with the way string is specified in the standard. Um, that the string will be left in a valid state. So you can call empty. What you can't do 
is, you know, let's say that you had a string that was, you know, so many characters, and, and once upon a time you, will, you were able to do an array index into that string and suck out a character. Okay. Once you've done the move from that, you can no longer assume you can do that same array index. You kind of have to go back and revisit it. It's like, like a, an iterator at that point, you know, that you actually, you can, you can examine it, you can ask it stuff, but, but its state has changed. So, and that has to do with specifically with the, the, the people who wrote the standard decided that their types needed to be fairly well behaved when they were moved from. But that's, if you write a movable, some, something that can be moved from, then you're not necessarily constrained to that rule. Okay, but the standard decided to be nicer. Yeah. Does that, does that make sense? Yes. I'm going to get corrected again. <laughs> oh, well, That's I'm good. This is a little bit of a question. But, um, so, because he, he asked, is, is it a valid reference, right? So, because the, the doesn't move says that, that you still have to have a valid reference when you're done. It's just your, your object may not be in a, is in an unspecified state. So, any of the operations your object might not work. <coughs> But it's still a, but it's still a valid reference. It, I, it just, it, I'm just, I don't know if that's what you asked. We're not talking about references, actually. Okay. We're talking about a move from standard string, which could be an object. Okay. Do I need to repeat any of that for the? Okay, we're good. Thanks, Ju. Let's I mean, see. I just want to also want to make sure I fully understood that. Also okay. Understood okay. That. Yeah. No. So, so the the string's still sitting there. You know, the, but but somebody stole the guts out. Yeah. Potentially. You know, if there were no guts to steal, then then potentially nothing got affected. And that and so you'll see in the slides, I I try to go to some effort to make my strings long so that I can avoid the uh, the small string optimization. That's that's me weaseling. Okay, I I cannot guarantee that for your implementation that will work. John, I just wanted to point out that if you take the size of the string, you're probably on safe grounds if your string is bigger. Take the size of the string object. You, that we have to do this too. Yeah. So we want to make sure our short string optimization is not dominating the whole thing. Okay. So, take so the size of it, you know how long it needs to be at least. Okay. So John's saying that you can, if you take the size of the string, you're probably safe. Thank you. No, yes. So oh, so and uh, do you want a glider? Do you want? We only have one glider left. No. Somebody else gets the glider. I want the cow. You want the cow. <laughs> I have to test it. Yeah, that worked. I'll be using this all day. <laughs> so, question? Yes. So, does the standard make no requirement at all on a move from object? So, if you define your own move. Oh, yeah. So, there. Is there any requirement at all? I mean, if I call explicitly the destructor for that object in the move, mm -hmm. so obviously the destructor can't run again. Right. Is that legal or yeah. is that. Yeah, so the, the question is, does the standard inf uh, require anything in particular for a moved from object? And so, so there's one for sure. The for sure is that this is, the destructor has to be able to run. Okay. okay. There's, there's another one that, that I think is not necessarily a requirement, but is a very, very good idea, and that is, if your object allows assignment, it should be assignable. But I don't know that the uh, compiler uh, or that, that the uh, standard requires that. So that's just an, an, a particularly excellent idea. Yes? If, if you're going to put the type into, uh, say, a standard vector, it's a good idea to have it assignable because otherwise it'll break when you resize or something like that. Uh, to, to have it what? Assignable. Assignable, yeah. OK. So, so if you're going to put the object into a, a vector, the, the statement was, finger trap, yes, a please. cow? Okay, finger trap. So um, if you're going to put the object into something like a standard vector, then having it be assignable is an excellent idea, is the statement. Yes? Are the move uh, structures also automatically created for objects where moving doesn't make sense? Where you don't have any uh, free memory parts, 
Um, you know, I didn't test that. So the, the question was, uh, if you have an object that doesn't have anything that's movable, are the uh, move operations still generated for it? I'm not sure I know how I would have tested that. Uh, be, what's that? You could test it. Oh, OK. You could, do, you could do it with, this, with the. Uh, and the answer, I believe, is yes. OK. That it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So, so Todd says that, yes, it would create it, and, and the effect would be that it would do the copy. And so what do you get, Todd? Oh, um, I'll take a uh, glider. OK. The gliders are gone. OK, great questions. So the thing about the implicit operations is that they're really easy to lose. Um, so I don't want you to memorize this. I just want this to be scary. <laughs> so and thinking only about the move constructor. OK? So, so if, you've, if you had, you, know, you created a really simple object, and it had a move constructor, as soon as you start adding members to it, this stuff starts to evaporate. OK? So this implicit stuff, which you can't see in the file anyway, it starts to disappear. And, and to me, this is particularly problematic because the functions that your, your object provides, that's really part, that's your contract. And so whether you can see it in the file or not, people can still call it. It's still part of your contract. This is half of the rules. Here are more rules. These are things that can make your, uh, your implicit copy constructor or, or, or move, excuse me, your implicit uh, move constructor or move assignment. Well, in particular, we're looking at the move constructor only here. These are things that can make the move constructor disappear. There are corresponding rules that will make the move assignment disappear. So if you're going to rely on an implicit function, uh, you can either guarantee that it's present with a static assert immediately after the declaration of the class. And that way, once you're, while you're modifying your class, you can see whether, yeah, I assumed that that implicit thing was going to be there, and it disappeared. Or you can explicitly request the default implementation using the equals default. Or both, right? Beg pardon? Or both. Or both. Yes. Both is, both is a great idea. Thank you, John. Yes. No, I, uh, that was a great point. Uh, request is a is is a bad term for that. Uh, cow or finger trap? Whichever. Cow. Cow. So the more thematic. Oh, so this one's a silent cow. <laughs> members. Um, and if you had that condition, would it generate one and make them copies and move everything else, or would it just say I can't generate it? It just uh, doesn't generate it. Yeah. yeah. So if there's anything in there that isn't movable, it's not movable. But, but, if, you, I think, but if you explicitly request the default behavior, do you get a compiler, or is it just silently not generated? The default uh, it, behavior is to generate a move constructor if it can be trivially generated. If it can't be trivially generated, the default behavior is to not supply one. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so if you we'll, just say, please do this for me if possible, and it's not possible, then you don't get it. So, so it is a request. Uh, no, I, I, I think you're right that, that if you say equals default on a move, I wish I had my compiler here. <laughs> if it can't do it, it won't compile. I, I believe I, I believe I experienced that. The reason that this typical reason you use an equals default is either because of your coding convention wants you to just be really explicit, uh, which isn't a bad idea, or you have used you have declared one of the special functions like a constructor 
that would disable it, and you and you want to say, actually, I do want it, and it should be the default. Yeah. Okay. So, do you get another finger trap? <laughs> okay. So, so, I, I, yeah, I believe I, I believe that you're, you know, I, I'm, I'm agreeing with you that if you say equals default and it can't generate it, then you'll get a compile error. Well, let's see. So, where am I? Okay, so what I've got here is uh, a unique pointer. Unique pointers. Sorry, I just wanted to touch on. I think this is actually a little bit of a guide uh, because if something is uh, copy constructible or copy assignable, it is move assignable and move constructible. So I, it doesn't necessarily, your static asserts, I don't think necessarily mean that a move constructor uh, has been actually created. It could just mean that the copy constructor is no sense. I think that trait will still be true in that case. I'm not sure if it really matters because if it's a no accept copyable, then you're probably all right and you probably don't need a move, but I just wanted to point that out. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> that's, that's good. That's good. So anyway, what I've done is I've, I've put a unique pointer in here. A unique pointer is move only. And it sounds like there's an error in the slide. Um, but uh, what I get out of this is that because unique pointer is, is only movable, it is not copyable, uh, then you, uh, let's see, you can't move, con or move construct is, is uh, true, but copy constructable is false. So, so in this case it works. So in, in this case it works, okay. So, but that has to do with, with unique pointer being the member rather than a string. And we'll test it, and this doesn't compile. There's no copy. So the next thing to do is, well, let's see. Yep, OK. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, yeah, I explicitly want this thing. And our static assert works. And. Uh, we're going to test it. And what happened, because we added this move constructor, we took out our copy constructor. So, and just, just to be clear, we've gone back to the string example. So with the string example, we, we could both copy and, uh, and move. But because we declared one of these guys, this one, went, or the, uh, the copy constructor went away. So there are still risks even when you're explicitly declaring these guys. Now the nice thing is we got this at compile time. If you're building a, a library, then you know, you're more clever than you know, all this. But uh, you know, at least when you called it, it, it didn't fail silently. So explicitly, explicitly declaring the move constructor deleted the implicit copy constructor. If you're going to default or delete any of the special member functions, then it probably makes sense to do all of them. So do the whole set. And uh, at least uh, when you talk with Howard Hennett, Howard will suggest that you just go ahead and do six static asserts after pretty much every class, and depends on, on how good you are. But it's, there's no runtime cost, is the nice thing about that. So you've got all these traits, you can use them. There are no throw, uh, no throw and, and without no throw versions of all of these traits. So now that we've uh, now that we've got all of them, they all work. So if we've got movable types, so I've got I've got my string, 
which I didn't, yeah, okay. So the string fell off the bottom of the slide, but I've still got a string, my s underscore. Um, so here I've got this uh, R value reference, and I'm gonna move that R value reference into my uh, string, my local string. Uh, I gave it away, there is a bug here, uh, and I'm sure a number of the folks in this room know what that bug is. Somebody shout it out, and then I can give you a finger trap. Yeah, so what's, what's the problem here? That's doing a copy. Yeah. So, um, actually, I've still got cows left. You want a cow for that? Yeah, sure. Uh, this is a functional cow. Send that cow back. So this is a copy. That's not a move. Why is that? So again, what we're doing is we're looking at the moved from object, and that failed. So the problem is that this, even though it's an R value reference, that's what we would call it. It's not an R value reference. That's an L value. <laughs> it's got a name. I can refer to that. I can go pick up that memory in RHS. So even though it says, move you know, with a double ampersand, that's an L value. You have to move from it. So if you go back many slides and we talked about what's an L value, this thing with a name, that's an L value. So to me, this is, we're staring at the biggest user trap in R value references, period. That my general you, uh, assumptions with things in C++ is when I see the name of what I'm looking at, I can't do this with auto anymore, but if I've got something other than an auto and I'm looking at it and it's, it basically it's telling me what it is, that's not the case. This is not an R value. This is an L value. You have to move it. I probably beat that horse hard enough. But, but, you know, this was one of the first things that, that bit me, and it's really easy to mess up. So, when you're, uh, when you're moving, when you're inside of this signature, you have to call standard move if you want it to behave right. Otherwise, you get a bug, and I'm going to get corrected again. So That's good. Slide, the thing is, you're not passing RHS into that constructor. You're passing its member. Yeah. Its so, it doesn't matter that RHS is an R value, whether it's an R value reference or an L value. Yeah. Doesn't it matter what if S underscore is an R value reference or an L value? That's actually an excellent point and a, and a good correction, thank you. That uh, the, the statement was that it's, it's the dot S is what's actually getting passed. What I will say is that if it, if it weren't the dot S, if it were the RHS that were being passed into the constructor, the same thing would be true. But thank you for the correction. And uh, let's see, do you, you, have, you have both a cow, or do you have a cow yet? I have a cow. You have a cow, do you have a finger trap? I don't have a finger trap. Okay, well you get the finger trap. <laughs> so, thank you. So, but you do have to move from it. So, always use that. Always use standard move. Um, there is no runtime cost to the move. It's just casting. So there are situations, you know, like if you have an int, you don't, you don't necessarily need to call move. But that's okay, it never hurts. There's no, never any harm to calling move in this situation where, where you're moving. So always call standard move. Yeah, so here we are, we've uh, basically fixed the, fixed the bug. And the test passes. So in terms of move assignment, so this is a bad test for move assignment with, with string in particular. Um, our string is our, again, our sort of the thing that we're carrying around. 
So uh, I'm sure someone's going to tell me why. I've put you all to sleep again. So uh, it is allowed that the string move assignment may be implemented with swap. So we're going to assume that the move from object will be destroyed soon. Because what we're doing is we're saying that thing's a zombie. That's about to go away. So we, don't, we, we can do more than just turn it into a zombie. We can pile our garbage onto it. So in the case of assignment, you've got, you've got a string sitting here in your hand that you don't want anymore. You want the one from the other side. So rather than, than unloading that stuff into, back into the free store, you can just do a swap. And eventually, you know, when that uh, R value reference, when its destructor runs, that, that uh, memory will eventually go back into the free store. Um, so that's, that's a way to implement uh, uh, move assignment. So testing move from objects is dubious. The destructor is guaranteed to work. Um, I think, you know, again, I don't think this is required by the standard, but you should certainly, anything that comes out of the standard will do this. And you're really smart, uh, if, or you, 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 you're avoiding a lot of trouble for yourself if you do this. Does that swap doesn't work? Is that right? With that, if you don't combine like that. Swap doesn't work, right. Thank you, Ray. So, cow? Sure. I think we only have one functional cow left. <laughs> and everything else is implementation dependent. But, at least in my experience, uh, and I haven't heard anyone disagree with me yet, uh, there are really only two ways of, of looking at, at move. You can either instrument a class so that you can say, I am calling this function and print something out or have some kind of a side effect. Uh, you can instrument the class or you can examine the thing that was moved from. You, um, oh, here's Todd's got another suggestion. Go yeah, ahead. I forget who it was that yeah. said he, he was right. Um, Having a copy constructor that accepts a const whatever ref is sufficient to be move, to be considered move constructible. If that copy constructor is no accept, then you are no accept move constructible. Okay. Did that pick up on the? Okay. So I won't repeat that. Thank you. So yeah, I'm not sure how you actually. Yeah, I don't. So John. These horrible things called allocators, and if you just measure directly what memory is going on, it's all done. <laughs> okay. Okay. So John says there's yet yet one more way to look at it, and you can look. The only way. Okay. So John says that. Yeah, yeah. To actually look at the memory through the, using the allocator. It's actually really easy because we have a notion of a test allocator that lives in every test driver. You just plug it in, and it'll it'll let you know what, what the memory usage is. It's done. It's done right up right out of the box. Oh. Uh, okay. Okay. It's a good way to do it. Okay. Well. Thank you, John. Um, let's see, you have a... Oh, a finger thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, John says, John says, be more clever than I was, put in a test allocator. Yes. Kevin's right. Yes, there is one. And in fact, he could tell you where to go look to see this in practice. All the test drivers, all the code. Yeah, if, all you're, if you're interested, just find me after the talk. Okay. Thank you. 15 minutes. I got to move faster. So, um, generally, if you're, if you're going to start implementing stuff by hand, avoid loose pointers. Uh, 
put uh, free store objects in a, or keep track of free store objects using a unique pointer. And then let unique pointer do the moving. So here, because we've, we've got a, a pointer to a string, we can actually use the default implementation for the uh, uh, move constructor and the move assignment operator. We have to do more work here, but that's work we had to do anyway to allow for copy. And if you really insist on doing this stuff, and you know, honestly, you, if you're, if you're dealing with something other than the free store, if you're dealing with an OS object, you have to do something equivalent to that. You, know, you don't get to call delete, but you have to call some OS function to say, I'm releasing this thing. So you have to do this kind of work. Aren't you repeating the copy issue here? I beg your pardon? Um, I'm, it's a pointer. Okay. Yeah. So when if you if you really if you really end up getting down to the to the the base level, this is this is what we're doing. We've got to do two things. We've got to take stuff from the right hand side. And then we have to uh, tell the right-hand side that it's now empty. Let's talk about move assignment to self. So, Go back to that. Yes. You just demonstrated why people recommend using swap to do that. Because you didn't free what P pointed to before copying P from the other object. Oh, that's in your yeah, this is in my constructor. Um, but yes, as a, I, I will agree with you <laughs> that this is. Yeah, so so this is this is in terms of memory, this is not recommended. You know, use use unique pointer. Unique pointer does the right thing. Uh, it's really easy to forget to delete stuff. So finger trap. Okay. I'm going backwards. Let's not go backwards. So move assignment to self. Um, in general, um, move assignment to self from the standard library uh, may leave you with an empty object. So it's not guaranteed to be a no-op. Um, it is guaranteed to be uh, crumb. OK. So standard string, if you look at the standard, standard string is, is so ubiquitous that they said, yeah, if you do move, uh, move assignment to self, that, this, that, that that is a no-op on string. But on pretty much anything else, the, the behavior is not guaranteed. On unique pointer in GCC 4.8.2, it is a no-op, at least in Windows. <laughs> I don't know anywhere else. Um, but you know, move assignment to self. Move assignment is supposed to be an optimization. And so if you've, I, if you think about that, that test, so I, I personally like doing the test because I like to know what's going on. Um, but if you think about doing this test inside of, you know, here I am, I've got a vector of 10,000 things. Do I want to do that test for self 10,000 times when what I'm doing is an optimization? Um, you may not want that. You may choose to, to have move assignment to self leave you with an empty object. That's a, a, a valid approach as far as the standard is concerned, I believe. John's looking at me sideways. I'm nervous now. Okay. <laughs> so um, if we're going to talk about non-free store moves, so something, some sort of an OS kind of a thing. Uh, so I'm going to prefer that, you know, and I'm, I'm the novice, but I'll have a bias anyway and then take it for what it's worth. Um, I think that, that swap-like behavior is not clever in this case because, you know, if you've, whatever kind of file system object you've got, whether it's a file handle or whatever else, if you do the swap, then the point where the destruction runs is outside of your control. 
you've, you're, you're deferring that destructor for some indefinite amount of time. It's, Howard Hinnant would say, it's not indefinite. You know, we know that, that when the scope of that object ends, that the destructor will run. But you're no longer you know, here in your code. You're leaving it to someone else's code that eventually you're trusting them to run the destructor. So I think it makes sense to not do the swap thing if you're dealing with non-free store. Now, we've been talking about assignment and, uh, and constructors. How about setters? Yeah, okay, for, uh, and, and I ended up going with a uh, multi-argument or, or a, uh, a constructor from not the same thing. So I've got a constructor from a string for my file. And yeah, this works great. This is not a, not a bad thing to do. Now, how about if I've got a multi-argument constructor? So here I've got a path and a file. I'm going to pass in two strings. Well, you know, wouldn't it be cool to be able to do a move with that? Well, what happens if, if only one of them is an R value? Well, or it could be the other one, or both of them. So this is just two arguments, and we've now gone all the way to having four constructors. This doesn't scale. And that's a setup for talking about universal references and perfect forwarding. And I think we should all just bask in the glow of the photo for a minute, because these are perfect cows. So tuple has a constructor that takes n arguments. How many things can you put in a tuple? And that probably has something to do with how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. So and any of those arguments may be R values. What do we do? So this, the, the folks who are working on move semantics said, we're going to make a special rule. We're going to make this thing, uh, if you have a template that's locally deduced and contains an R value reference with no const and no volatile in front of this, this one's really special. So there was this forewarning a long time ago. Okay, we've just walked into it. This is it. So this thing. Learn to recognize this. Scott Myers calls this, this use of double ampersand a universal reference. And it binds to almost anything. Um, so in, when you recognize this, you have to make sure there is no const or volatile in that t and and. And t must be locally deduced. That means that if you're, you know, let's say you've got a, a vector the vector is of a type, then as long as that type is what you're referring to in your, in your method, that's not locally deduced because the vector determined that type. Did that make any sense to anybody? I put you to sleep again. That's all right. Say again. So, so I've got a vector of t, and I've got five minutes. I've got a vector of t. If I use t in a method of that vector, then t is not locally deduced in that method. And that's not a universal reference. It's only if that method, now if I, if I don't use t, but I use p or q, something that isn't determined by the type of the vector, then it's free to, to be able to adjust. And in that case, this is a universal reference. So universal reference type decodes, you know, since we've only got five minutes, I'm going to slip just past this stuff because this was interesting to me, but I think it's not that important for people to know. What I'm doing is I'm building the perfect forwarding stuff. Um, and all I want to say is use perfect forward. Don't build stuff yourself. So here, if I have a, uh, a universal reference, 
So here we've got a locally deduced type P and a locally deduced type F. And I've got those in here. I want to call standard forward on that. I don't want to call move. I want to call standard forward. And now those four distinct constructors turned into a single templating <coughs> constructor. And let's test it. And it worked. Um, so Howard Hennant saw that and, and immediately said, that's not a very good templated constructor. You really should guard it. So uh, his, his recommendation is to use the enable if, because we really only want to accept arguments that will convert into a string. Okay. I don't know what happened there. Or did I just run? Is that, that's 6 o'clock. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay. Huh. There's some magic button there. So. We've seen that. So there are things that you can't perfectly forward. For the most part, most of us ordinary programmers don't care. I, I shouldn't say us, you know, just me. <laughs> ordinary programmers don't care about most of these. Um, don't move a universal from a universal reference. Use forward. Uh, the problem is that a non-const L value, if you use move inside of there, a non-const L value will be moved from. So you definitely want to call forward. And so it's really important to be able to identify the difference between a, a, a universal reference. Which, again, that won't show up in the standard. In the standard, they call that an R value reference. <coughs> I think Scott Myers is really smart, saying these are really two different kinds of animals. Let's give them different names. OK. So we're going to do some overloading with universal references. This is me walking through making as many mistakes as possible so that hopefully we can end up someplace useful. So I've got this class that I was thrashing about with, and you know I wasn't paying very close attention. And this is forwarding because I've got this locally deduced s, and uh, so you know, or particularly here, I've got this locally deduced s. Here, here are my double ampersands, and I got this move. But I wasn't thinking about universal references. I was thinking about I'm, I'm trying to do R value references. Um, and this one's particularly bad because uh, this is a, 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 a runtime failure. What we've got is a, uh, a non const string, and we're running this constructor with it, and we've just emptied that string. We turned that string into a zombie because we called move inside of a universal reference. So the cure for that is to recognize universal references and always use standard forward when you see them. So here's the next bug. We recognize the error of our ways. We said, oh, this is a universal reference. It binds to anything. And uh, so I've got my two constructors here, my uh, R value reference. Uh, uh, move constructor, my copy constructor, and I've got my cool special constructor that does the, the forwarding so that I can, can forward strings. This also has a bug because this universal reference will bind to anything. This one's not as bad. So here um, I've got a non-const uh, bad move two, and I'm passing that in here. It's going to go to the wrong constructor. 
it's going to go to the one that we, we weren't thinking about. That's the, we, we expected it to go here to this const L value. But it doesn't bind here because it's not const. It binds here. So how do we fix that? Universal references bind to anything that other overloads don't explicitly specify. So Scott Meyer suggests avoid overloads on universal references. Sometimes you can't. So here what I've done is I've said, all right, well, by gum, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do all kinds of, of, of template heroics. I'm going to do tag dispatch. I'm going to look at the type that got passed in. And if the type is my type, uh, let's see if I can dig it out of here. There I am, is same, bad move. And I'm removing the, the constant and volatile. And I'm removing references. Is this my type? And if, if it is my type, then I'm going to call uh, one of these two. And if it's not my type, I'm going to call this one. All kinds of heroics here. And what I've done to make sure that these two guys don't get called is I've deleted them. This doesn't work either. Because when you delete a method, you can't refer to it at all. You didn't just say, compiler, please don't implement this for me. You said, this cannot exist in any form. You may not refer to a deleted function. A program that refers to a deleted function implicitly or explicitly, other than to declare it, is ill-formed. So that's not a way out. So we have to implement these guys. We still have this one. So we've got three private constructors. We've got three public constructors, one of which with this terrifying template stuff going on. So, but this, this passes my test. Once I've gone to this level, it passes my test. Showed this to one of my reviewers. He said, there's a better way. Um, yeah, and he's a smart guy. Uh, so if you do, in, in this particular case, because uh, our class, OKMove, okay does not have a conversion to string operator, we can do this. We can say, if what's being passed in is a string, then, then do, uh, do this forwarding operation. Otherwise, do this. So this is one of those cases where um, tag dispatch is, is less good than the enable if trick. How badly do you want that universal reference overload? You decide. So guidance. Don't return const objects, because that defeats moving. Use and and only in signatures, although I think that's not necessarily valid suggestion now. OK? There are, there are apparently cases where that's useful. Don't use const and uh, double and signatures, because you want to be able to steal from that thing. Prefer, when you can do it, prefer no, no accept, because you get better results. Don't standard move return values. It disables the return value optimization. Use static asserts to validate your special member functions. <coughs> Learn to recognize the difference between uni universal references and ordinary R-value references. Use standard move with R-value references, forward with universal references. Be careful when you're overloading on universal references and test your work. Probably with uh, um, test, allocators. test allocators. Um, we're five minutes over time, but uh, I, I think it's worth making the point that uh, move semantics is not a cure-all. 
and uh, this article by Eric Niebler came up in, I think, at least one of the other talks earlier. This is, this is really interesting, using uh, uh, stateful objects for returning information. And these are my sources, and the, the slides will be available. Thanks. <laughs>